You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan White. Welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Today, John Harris and I will be exploring new avenues available to photographers for finding work and project funding. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you, you, our listeners, to take a few moments and let us know how we're doing. Your feedback is important to us, and it enables us to further increase the value of our show. Tweet us at BHPhotoVideo with the hashtag BHPhotoPodcast, or email us at podcast at BHPhoto.com. The traditional methods photographers have used to secure work have gone the way of payphones and free peanuts in the airlines. For years, it was pretty straightforward. Editors would use staff photographers to cover stories, while artists and documentarians typically self-funded their projects with the hope of recouping the costs and maybe even making a profit from gallery sales or magazine spreads. Then little things like the internet and mobile and digital technologies came along, and before you know it, Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. Since then, we've been busy picking up the pieces while trying to figure out how to find another day's pay. Our guests today are already on the case. Their organizations are providing innovative ways to put photographers together with those that can hire them or fund their work. Matt Craig is a former photo editor at the Wall Street Journal and co-founder of Blink, a real-time location platform that enables editors and potential clients to locate photographers and vice versa. Teresa Hubbard is program specialist of the fiscal sponsorship program at Fractured Atlas, an organization that eliminates the practical barriers to artistic expression. The fiscal sponsorship program works by enabling artists to utilize Fractured Atlas's nonprofit status to raise funds that would otherwise be unavailable to them. Welcome to both of you. We'll start with Matt, and after a brief pause, Teresa will fill us in on the inner workings of Fractured Atlas. Then we'll open up the conversation to our guests and see where things go. Matt, tell us about Blink and how did you get involved in this endeavor? Uh, So Blink started in 2014. We launched a product in in January 2014. But really the... um, and the problem that we were were solving started well before that. I joined the Wall Street Journal uh, in 2008, right after it was purchased by News Corporation, and, and I was part of a really small team of photo editors who were kind of introducing visual journalism to the paper. You know, the journal was known for uh, dot drawings and pie charts, and uh, after News Corp came in, you know, there was this big push for visual content, photography, multimedia, video for for the print edition, but also for online. Uh, so my my co-founder Julian and I, he was also at the journal. He was in charge of world news uh you know it was it was up to us to illustrate tons of breaking news and also feature stories right they were happening all over the world um and because we were new in the visual journalism world we didn't have that big base of staff photographers and we hired exclusively freelance uh so very quickly you know you go from one to 100 miles an hour you need you go from not covering anything visually or using just the wires to needing photographers and I was doing you know, anywhere from 50 to 60 assignments a month, and my partners, you know, across the department were doing a similar volume. So we were, you know, pushing out a lot of assignments and creating a lot of original content. The problem was finding those people to create the content. And, you know, pretty soon we figured out, you know, we could spend, you know, two or three days on shooting days by hiring someone locally or waste half that budget on travel. Right, because you didn't know anybody in Topeka, so you had to send them from, uh, you know, the nearest big market. Or you're trying to respond to breaking news in South America, and you end up shipping someone from Rio to go cover a small story in Peru. And these are the kind of inefficiencies that we faced every single day. Right, you, you were always had a need for people all over the world, but my Rolodex was only so large. And on top of that, you know, keeping up on the, the hundreds of thousands of freelancers out there, their movements, I mean, it's a very transient uh, life for these freelancers. I'm gonna, I'm gonna back up real quick. Um, the way that these freelancers make their money is they go and they cover stories that are breaking, right? You can't sit at home and wait for the phone to ring anymore. Keeping every buyer in the market updated on where you're going and when you're going to be there is, is impossible because a photo editor's inbox is, is, is a chaotic and horrible place to be, <laughs> right? Uh, and I would yeah. get emails nonstop every day from these guys telling me where they were headed, but it's impossible to keep up. So the idea started to formulate. And, of course, I was a young person. I was, in, I was on page one, but I was really young. I was 24, 25. Technology is part of my life in kind of every way. But when I went to work, 
and 10 hours I was in the office, all I had was this inbox and a telephone. Uh, so I could order uh, a pizza on my on my phone. I could book a, a hotel or or stay in a stranger's apartment in Peru if I wanted to tomorrow. But if I wanted to find a photographer in Chicago, uh, I had to you know call five people and figure that out the hard way, right? So these pieces started to come together. Let's take no brainer technology, location data from people's mobile phones, and let's build a really curated and high value professional network of freelance photographers and video producers all over the world. Let's get that location data from those freelancers. Let's pipe it into a searchable database and let's market that So you that were talking out. about this at the, when you were at the journal already, trying to yeah. develop something like this for the journal. Um, so the journal had a map. They had this Google map, but, but it didn't have any real-time location data and it was up to us to keep it updated. And so, you know, old data is bad data. Like no location data is it's bad. Right? I guess the old models work fine because your problem was nothing unique. I mean, it, news was happening before you got to the journal and, and stories were breaking all over the planet well before them, but they were just very, very different models. Yeah, I think that people did it the hard way. Before the big crash, I think photo agencies were doing an amazing job. They were out there, they were pitching stories, they were representing photographers all over the place, but that that industry started to, to break down, right? And you know, on the other side, you've got more people shooting than ever before. Right? You've got the market being flooded by talent, and I'm going to argue that, that talent is, is amazing talent. It's not just guys with, with iPhones. I think you're finding nowadays, you know, there's great people with 5Ds and 35 primes in every country in the world. There's a local 25-year-old Bangladeshi kid who can shoot like the best of them, but he can never afford to come to New York for that photo editor interview or portfolio review, right? It's just never going to happen. But that person is in their local market. They can tell their story better than anybody else. Um, and so, you know, just there were these kind of breakdowns. And, and to be honest, as a photo editor, I wanted to hire that local person nine times out of ten, right? I just never knew who they were. And so Blink is an opportunity for that person to jump on our network and to be part of this global media market uh, and be found for work where they live, right? It's not just about keeping track of journalists as they move from place to place. It's for you know, building this kind of village and, and letting more and more people be a part of the game uh, because they're they're totally capable. They can shoot at a really high level, but they just don't have access to the clients. So let me ask you a question. Back in, I think, 1993, when I got my first Apple Tower, which had a 286 megahertz chip in it, it was a powerful box. Um, I got a modem and I got it to work, and there was a program called PhotoNet, which I think is still around, if I'm not mistaken. And it was interesting because I can go on there, and if people needed assignments in all over the place or they needed a stock photograph, they would post it. If I was going to be traveling somewhere and back then I was traveling, I'd be able to post a thing saying, hey, I'm going to be in so-and-so for these dates. Um, and I would get some assignments, and I would sell stock. How is, how is Blink different than that? I mean, aside from the fact that technology has come a long ways. Yeah, well, I don't know enough about PhotoNet to really make hard comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, but I can say that you know before Blink got uh, before Blink came out, there was a site called Lightstalkers, right? And Lightstalkers came out around 2004, um, and I think it burned out. You know, three or four years later, it existed kind of in a shell afterwards. But you know, it's a similar concept. Let's take let's create a home on the web for all of these freelancers to be part of discussions to uh, pick up on possible assignments. But it was. It was never really utilized for sourcing people. I think by the companies, it was just kind of a, a, a reference tool, but it wasn't like a daily production tool. And you know, one thing about startups and technology, it's all about timing. You have to enter the market at the right time. And so I think, you know, uh, Taru, who was the founder with his brother of Lightstalkers, you know, they had the same idea that we did. You know, this this community, this family needed better services. They needed a better platform. They just came too early on it. And I think what they were also missing was location data, right? Blink secret sauce is that we're getting tens of thousands of location updates from these freelancers. And, and just to be clear, these are uh, people are clicking a button to send us their location data. We're not pulling it passively off of their phones, right? So people are actively updating their location on our network. Um, and that's that's the most critical element, right? You, you want to know when you reach out to a freelancer on Blink that they're exactly where you need them. And so, you know, the fact that we have that, plus we have a very, very curated network. We have over 100 partnerships with photo agencies and collectives around the world. I think those are all contributing factors that make Blink I was going to ask you, you winner. are interfacing with all of these established uh, bureaus then? Uh, yeah. I mean, okay. the photo agencies, the collectives, 
these are people that we we wanted to play ball with. We didn't sure. want to exclude them, right? Okay. It's that like ten person photo collective from Spain, right? It's it's Leif from Germany. It's it's Agence Vu. We want to be, we want them to be part of this. And I think the the best photo collectives and the best photo agencies see the value in what we've built, and they want to be involved as well. Interesting, and. Is it primarily for the photojournalist? Well, you start with what you know, yeah. right? And that's that's where you build businesses is you start in a market that you know very well. You know, we've been photo editing for a long time. My partner Julian's been, you know, at, at Magnum Photos as an editorial director. He was at Newsweek. He was at the Journal. So we knew all the players, not all, certainly not all. Now that I'm two years in, I realize I need a <laughs> fraction of the market. It's amazing how many people are out there doing this. But, um, you know, we had a really solid base to start from. Uh, but the network has become more and more diverse. It's something that is really, really, uh, it's an amazing thing to sit back and look at a network that's grown for two years and you see that it's not just photojournalists out there, that there's lifestyle photographers, there's ad advertising photographers, production companies on the buyer side. It's not just the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. There are brands, there are NGOs and humanitarian organizations, small creative agencies. I mean, there's so many people coming to the table, so there's no limit. I mean, it's, in it's your, of, in your yeah. estimation, in your view, it can be any photographer in any discipline. Any well, we're looking for the professional crowd. You know, this is a place to to hire or be hired, and so we are really interested in people who are here to work. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, that doesn't mean that you know a 19 year old who's still you know over at Western Kentucky University can't jump on Blink because, in my opinion, that person is very hireable. Mm -hmm. But we do want people who are here to work. Uh, we want people who are serious about their craft this is not a place for you to like share pictures of, of holidays right? i was gonna ask you if you qualify because I, I know yesterday i joined up i'm a member of blink and so therefore you have zero qualifications you let, let you allowed me in that's um, true <laughs> um that's true yeah, where yeah, do you draw you the should line look into that, you know what actually uh <laughs> alan you were flagged uh no so we were an invite only network for the first 18 months and this really set us up for success and this uh, was okay. in our first big push all the, the major partnerships with the agencies, um, you know, and we were watching very carefully as the network grew, right? So it was it was a very organic thing. Companies were inviting their freelancers because they wanted to use this tool to manage all those relationships. And then the freelancers, you know, hey, they, they saw a blink. There's someone out there for them trying to improve their lives. I'm going to invite my friends. I'm going to invite my clients because I'm tired of emailing them my location updates, right? So this all made sense. We grew organically for the first 18 months. But when we re-released Blink in October of last year, a big part of it was a major upgrade to the back end. And there's an algorithm now that's looking at every user, measuring their engagement, measuring the quality of the user. You know, we don't want to, when you run a search for Las Vegas, Nevada, I don't want to show you 15 people who signed up and never came back. Mm -hmm. Right. Gotcha. So so, Alan, if you signed up yesterday, but you never come back, you're going to the very bottom. You're going to slot 4,000. I haven't signed off. And, and by come back, you, know? you mean just to update your location and stay in touch? Is well, so there's a bunch of best practices, and you could you could think of this in a similar way as Airbnb, right? Um, on Blink, if you have a complete profile with your portfolio, with links out to your work, if you're getting recommended by clients, if you're checking in on our mobile app and keeping your location up to date, which is a critical component. I mean, we basically, I don't want to say we've trained the buyer, but the buyers gravitate towards people who say, hey, I, I'm in Chicago three minutes ago, right? Mm -hmm. People go straight for that user. And, and does it serve a photographer who doesn't travel much? Somebody who, let's say, is in New York and 90% and of their work is in New York. Can it serve them? Um, absolutely, yeah. right? There's no reason why that photographer can't pop open the app once a week, hit that button, have a great profile, you know, respond quickly to incoming requests and, and go up in search results. This isn't just for the roaming vagabond. Of course, we, we offer an amazing service for the roaming vagabond journalist photographer who's constantly on the move. You know, that was idea one was mm -hmm. helping their buyers keep track of them, but it's not just for them. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think as we grow, um, you know, we really are looking at photo and video content, like visual content, I think is, is our niche and, and what we want to offer the buyers. Um, and so it'll be location updates will become less and less important over time. And what kind of space is there for the profile that, that photographers put? Do you is there, a, let's say, a portfolio involved? And in, yeah, it's yeah. it's pretty granular, right? Mm -hmm. So at at the top level, it's your your phone number, your email, right, and then all your social links, and then your portfolio. You can have photography, you can have video, you can upload PDFs of the work that you've done, links out to stories that you've done. How many done. pieces can you post? So right now, it's up to ten. Okay. Uh, we don't want to be like a, a hosting service. Right, 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 and, right. You know, we talked to editors and they said, look, I can take a look at a profile right now and I can decide within, you know, 
a few beats of the right. heart whether this this is is a is a go for me right, right? Um, so up to ten pieces of work photo and video is really what we we think people should have on there um, and then a bio. All of your professional skills, whether you're insured, uh, your agency affiliation uh, or collective affiliation. That insurance button was right up on top, too. Yeah, liability insurance yeah. is important. Number right? one was right up there. We have the phone number. That's right. And um, you know, that's just a, that's a good thing that people need to be thinking about on the freelancer side, but also on the on the buyer side. The yeah. insurance is very important. Um, you know, We're going to be pushing into the drone market pretty soon, which we're very excited about. And so you'll see right up at the top, FAA exemption status will be right up there. Mm -hmm. um, and, okay. uh, and we're looking at you know, France and Germany and the UK and looking at all these different companies, how they're approaching that kind of licensing. Can I jump back a bit to yeah, my, sure. my, my previous question? I'll just throw two, two worlds out there. Your wedding photographers, which to some degree stay local, but not necessarily. And, uh, and I work in on-set still photography. And in general, um, through, through a Facebook kind of link, we get notifications. Hey, I need somebody who's in this town or I need somebody in that town. And obviously it's not as effective as, as something that's like Blink. But uh, would do you consider reaching out to these type of photographers? Uh, when I was or, at the Journal, yeah. I could tell you uh, there is a, a pair of photographers in Mobile, Alabama, who are wedding photographers and who have shot uh, so many stories for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, we are not we're probably not the place for a wedding photographer to pick up a wedding assignment, but, but other work. Wedding sure. photographers, I mean, that's just Once you one leave the color. metropolitan areas, a lot of wedding photographers are also working for the local newspapers, sure. doing all kinds of events. You can't specialize when you live in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, you I mean, have in general, to be that's juggling. true, though. I think that's a, yeah. that's a good so, point that, that people yeah. do everything, you know. Oh, I, mean, I know plenty of wedding people that shoot sporting events, too. Oh, yeah. I, I'm a... CEO of a tech company, I shoot weddings, I shoot events, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, Are you on Blink? Uh, I certainly am. I have two profiles, in fact. Um, but look, a wedding photographer. Can you, can you make separate you profiles? Can, yeah, I'm just uh, gonna, it's interesting. Okay. I do just for testing reasons. I don't suggest anyone have okay. more than one profile. Um, you should have just one. Uh, mm -hmm. But the wedding photographer, the event photographer, uh, that person who's shooting marketing activations for brands, I mean, you have a home on Blink, absolutely. Portrait's a portrait. Emotion's emotion, good composition. Uh, doesn't matter what you're pointing a camera at. If you know what a moment is, if you know what light looks like, you know how to touch on that and really capture that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you've definitely got a place on Blink. And for set photographers, absolutely looking for more set photographers to join Blink. We've been talking to studios in LA and New York. Uh, they need a tool like Blink and, and we're happy to have you on board. Okay. Your site, number one, that, that is really, really good. It's it's clean, it's well done, it's well produced. I don't see any pop-up ads. There's no, nothing coming up to telling me that I could save on an auto rental the next time I go down to Tampa, St. Pete. How are you being funded by this? How are you paying your, who's paying your overhead? Yeah, so we were backed by investors. Um, okay. This was a, a clear opportunity to build a product, but we needed some investment to get this thing off the ground. Uh, that's kept us running for the last two years. Uh, we're looking at a bunch of different ways to monetize. I don't think advertising is going to be it for us. Uh, we like the look of the site. It's very clean and mm -hmm. professional marketplace. You know, you got to keep it utility. Um, so transactions are a big part of this. Uh and also a big part of the industry that needs more transparency and needs improvement. So changing the way that people are getting paid for their work, uh, making it a more online process, more streamlined, letting people know where their checks are, where their payments are. So it's not just, you know, drop an email to your client wondering, you know, at 120 days where your money's at. Um, you don't guarantee anything like that. If somebody gets a job through you, through Blink and they're waiting, you know, a year later, they haven't been paid. You're not, are you liable for anything? No. Involved in it? That's just between photographer and client? Yeah, we allow the connection between photographer and client. But you have no liability for No, that, so though. right now okay. the, the job creation happens off of the site. Okay. So you find, you know, I find Alan. I want to hire Alan. You look great. Um, you know, I, I usually send a message through Blink, jump on the phone, send the contract over, and then it kind of leaves our, our premises, right? Mm -hmm. But we want more of that to be happening on the site. Uh, and as you, bring, uh, as you bring buyers in, uh, who are not super sophisticated photo editors and don't do 100 assignments here, you need to build a platform for them to easily hire and pay people. It's the, it's the first time that you assign somebody that you need some help. You need a, a 
easy kind of job creation form, right? You need to lay out the deadline and the payment terms and licensing, and you need to pay them on your credit card. We want to build out that whole life cycle on the site. Um, there will be upgrades for freelancers. We realize, you know, as this thing is growing and growing and growing, there's uh, opportunities to build premium features for the freelancers who join. Uh, and then we have a product called Blink Pro, which is used by uh, a bunch of big media companies. Uh, it's basically group accounts on Blink where different bureaus can all tap into one shared network of contacts. So if you have uh, an office in New York, in LA, in London, all your photo editors tap into one shared network. So imagine a shared LinkedIn account. And that's account. a subscription, that's a, a paid and that's, subscription. And that's a paid yeah. subscription, yeah. right? Okay. It's also an engagement tool because if you can lock in you know, 20 photo editors at one company, they're gonna use you all the time and it's, it becomes a really valuable service that they kind of turn to every day. Okay. When we continue, we're gonna speak with Teresa about fractured assets Atlas and the Fiscal Sponsorship Program. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Teresa, tell us about Fractured Atlas. How did you get involved? And tell us about the company. It's very, very interesting, this whole approach to funding projects. Well, first, thank you for having me. Fractured Atlas is a nonprofit technology company that focuses on building tools, online tools, that art uh, that artists, um, arts organizations, anyone who's creating something can use to run the business side of their art. If you're making money off of your art or if you are um, intending to make a living from your art, it is your business. And so we really want to make sure that you have the tools that you need to run that business effectively, especially since they don't always teach us that in school. When you go to art school, you don't necessarily have an arts entrepreneurship type. As class. a graduate of two art schools, I can attest to that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, you, you kind of feel like you have to you have to major in arts business in order to get yes. that education. We really we try to build those tools so that we can help you learn if you didn't learn it previously. And even if you did learn it previously, we can give you those tools to help you manifest those skills that you've already learned. So we have four major programs that we work with. The first is fiscal sponsorship, which I can talk about a little bit later. Um, the second is we have a, an insurance program. So, you know, we were talking about liability insurance for photographers. That's definitely something that you can purchase through our website. The idea is that we have a number of proprietary policies that you can't necessarily find elsewhere. They're built specifically for the artist and for different artistic disciplines. So if you're a performer, you can go and find performance insurance, you can find visual arts insurance, you can find equipment, liability, any anything that you need for your mm -hmm. business. And if, you know, we're, we're very open about giving, about giving recommendations if we can't give you what exactly what you need. You need to be a member, obviously. Yes. Yeah. We also have an Artfully program. It's called Artfully, artful.ly. And this is a, a ticket selling and CRM service that you can use to manage all of your patrons, whether or not they are actually going to your events or if they're purchasing um, if they're purchasing tickets to your events or if they are making donations. You can put all of that information into Artfully so you can track your correspondences. And then the last program that I want to speak about is Space Finder, which is a marketplace that anyone can use to find space unique to your specific needs. We're live in about 13, 12 or 13 cultural hubs in the U.S., and then we're expanding into Canada as well. If you need a, a place that it allows you to take photographs, but it's also a dance studio, you can find that through Space Finder. Sort of like Airbnb, this is a, a source that you can use to find alternative spaces. Rehearsals, performances, shoots, anything. They're all, all that kind of, all of those um, items are search criteria mm -hmm. in the system. Mm -hmm. So you can use that. Now for raising money and yes. for getting funded, you, you your site talks a lot about 501c3 tax status. Yes, Fractured Atlas is a 501c3. And fiscal sponsorship allows an individual or an arts company or a anyone who's doing something creative to access the benefits, some of the benefits of our 501c3 status. Now, what are these benefits to the person? I, say I'm a performance artist and I want to get a space and dance for strangers, just or whatever. I hang an art show, hang a photography show, uh, work on a project. How would that affect me? So the, the biggest benefit of fiscal sponsorship is having access to charitable dollars. It's an alternative source of revenue that you can use to fund your work. 
other than just paying for your, or getting fees for services or having people pay to see your exhibits or something like that. This gives you the ability to create a network of donors who are going to give donations to Fractured Atlas, and we are going to hold the funds in a restricted fund and make them available to you as an individual so that we can then release those funds to you for your business expenses. So it's crowdfunding under adult supervision? Kind of. It's not, I mean, crowdfunding itself, the sort of term crowdfunding refers very specifically to the crowdfunding platforms that you see. Indiegogo, Kickstarter, uh, CrowdRise, Brazu, GoFundMe, you know, there are tons of them. But crowdsourcing is something that has existed in fundraising since the beginning of time. Okay. I mean, you look at any, if you go to any, any performance, that's, I mean, that's the mindset that I'm in right now because this is the best example I can give. So if you go to Lincoln Center Mm -hmm. and you go to a, a film or you go to a performance or something like that, you see this list of donors in the back of their program. Probably 80, 75% of them are individuals. The reality is that you can build this network of donors much like Lincoln Center has, much like any of the um, like film forum has and everything to, to establish this base of support that can carry you throughout time, carry you and help you fund your work. But as the artist or the photographer, in this case, it's your responsibility to, to find these, these donors, correct? I mean, yes. you may have the network, they may, you may offer a network to them that they can reach out to, but it's generally their responsibility to get the, the donations, correct? It is their responsibility because ultimately it's going to be the people who care about you and care about your work that you're going, that are going to fund it. Mm-hmm. And you want to reach out to them and continue to reach out to them, cultivate relationships with them so that you can make them that, so that you can, Encourage them to join your, what we call, we, we like to say a movement. You're creating a movement. You're asking people to engage in that movement and join you in creating something great. And do you see artists who come back time and time again for their second and the third and the fourth projects or they, they tend to be one-offs? Um, we actually see both. Mm-hmm. We have a number of, of organizations that are fiscally sponsored for their ongoing activities Um, But we also have people who are just doing one-off projects. We also have individual artists who are are fiscally sponsored for all of their artistic work Mm -hmm. ongoing. You Mm -hmm. know, they they know that they're going to be producing exhibits over and over and over again. And so they they have a continual fiscal sponsorship to support that instead of coming back and reapplying each time. Just makes it a little bit easier on everybody. And how does it work, for example, they're using your nonprofit status uh, and t- getting charitable donations. Mm-hmm. And then I assume mo- most people, you know, gonna, they want to turn a profit on their work to some degree. How does that, uh, how does that align with the mission? So there's a really big uh, misconception between paying yourself for the time that you spend on your work and making a profit. And there's also a big misconception between that a not for profit means that you can't make a profit. So there are the two sides to this. You can absolutely pay yourself to do the work that you do, and you should pay yourself. We absolutely we we believe that you as the artist are again running a business, and if you were running any sort of company, you would pay yourself for the time that you spent there, right? So is that taxable income? Is it considered taxable since it's you got it under these the 501c whatever? Yes. It will be taxable income. Uh, okay. So <laughs> Yes, of course you are. You're going to pay yourself, um, and then I'll, I, I can I'll respond a little bit more to the the taxable income part okay. right after this. <laughs> Again, um, I'm a creative type. I went to art school. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> I'm your customer. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, we we do want your work to be charitable because we're a charity, and you need um, part of part of being accepted is us deciding that you are helping us fulfill our charitable mission. So we want to see that you're serving an audience. We want to see that you are somehow giving the, a benefit to the public. Um, that doesn't mean that if you have a surplus at the end of your project, you can't, that, that's a bad thing. You know, everybody wants to create sustainable work every, and making a surplus is part of that. At most, or many 501c3s, even though they are not-for-profit charity, are making a surplus at the end of the year, but they use those funds to fund the next year. Okay. So if you have a surplus, we would encourage you to find ways to put that back into your work. So can you use it for next year's budget? 
did you have an intern that you only paid by giving them a Metro card? Can you pay them a little bit more? We're pretty good at finding creative solutions so that your surplus doesn't turn into somebody benefiting privately from your work. And the artist needs to supply you with financial statements and and all the facts and figures at the end of the... uh end of the the fiscal year. Is that how that works? We have an annual report that we have you submit at the end of, or 90 days after the end of the calendar year. We put it, we purposefully do it around tax time so that you can collect everything together and fill it all out at the same time instead of doing it on our fiscal year, which ends in August. If we had you put together all these, all these numbers at the end of the calendar year, and then you have to do it again at the beginning of the calendar year. It just becomes burdensome and people get confused. So, and do you have staff that help artists like Alan uh, <laughs> do things like do that? Things like that so we don't have any, I could be your poster boy. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any accountants or tax staff, um, in our office, but we have, we have excellent recommendations for those, okay. for those sorts of things because we're not equipped and we, we definitely do, um, we have met many accountants and many lawyers who so are... So you're a good referral service we are, as well. You could we are, be, can, Yeah, good for guidance. Absolutely. Okay. If we can't do something, we're going to try and find somebody who can help you do that. Um, so back to the taxable income. Yeah. So the, the funds that we release to you have to be used for your business expenses, which includes paying people. I'm just going to put that out there again. <laughs> um, it is released to you in the form of a grant. So it looks like a grant from Fractured Atlas. Grants are considered taxable income. The idea, though, is that you are only spending these for, for, for business expenses, so you should be able to offset that income with your business expenses. If you're paying yourself, you can expect to, you can very likely expect that you'll have to pay taxes on that just as an income tax like you would with any other 1099. Can we ask a bit about some of the photography projects? There are a few that I'm sure that everybody's heard of. We we have United Photo Industries, which produces Photoville every year. They're fiscally oh, yeah, sponsored yeah. Okay. by us, but they also um, maintain yearly activities or um, annual activities of exhibiting different artists' work. We have... That seems to be kind of a perfect fit for what you're doing. That would be a good you, application. It yeah. was a great, yeah. Can, can you describe Photoville a bit for people that may not know? Their, their whole mission is to put photographic exhibits in unconventional spaces. So you'll see them on the street. You'll see them all over the place. And they, um, Photoville is, of course, their big festival every year in Brooklyn. Another another pro- um, project that I found was Through the Eyes of Hope project. And this is a, a project that uses, that focuses on giving cameras to children in Africa, I think specifically in Rwanda and oh, yeah, in New York I've City. Some of that. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so it acts sort of as this cultural exchange, but really it's a way for for children who may not otherwise have access to these these um, this art making practice. They they get to learn about it, and they do that by through hands on experiences. You know, they get to take photos, they get to do their own projects. Those are two examples of people who have created a business based on exhibiting other people's work mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then sort of this arts education component. And then another one that we see pretty pretty frequently is dark rooms. So we have like the Bushwick commu- community dark room and the Gowanus dark room, both of which are they do what they they sound like they're doing. <laughs> um, you know, they're giving. I think it's all rentable space, or you can come in and and see um, develop your own photographs there. Mm-hmm. Um, That's great. Yeah. So those are those are the three examples that I, I wanted. I to... mean, I found several examples of people who you know funded photo shows, yeah. projects, and books. You know, just individual photographers doing their work. That's and, a good uh, point. Yeah, we yeah. we definitely have, especially recently, I've noticed a lot of a lot of projects coming in to create books. Mm-hmm. And you as guys, well. from what I read, you don't curate, quote unquote. You don't. Uh, I mean, a- anything is open. I mean, any application is open, pretty much. Exactly. Yeah. We we are very firmly non-curatorial and we we believe that if you want to make art you should have the opportunity to make art okay when we come back we can open up our conversation to our guests talk about new technologies and how they're helping photographers find work if you'd like to reach out to us with your questions or comments email us at podcast at bhphoto.com let's talk about specifically for photographers try to keep it narrowed down because that's pretty much who's listening to this show. Um, where we go from here, what are the options that 
photographers have as far as getting work, getting funded. Something that you you touched on earlier was, you know, diversity in your work, right? And mm-hmm. this is something that I, I firmly believe in. Um, you know, if you are just getting into the industry now as a young person, um, you know, that staff photographer job is just not waiting for you on the other side of college, right? Oh, and yes. So, so you need to be thinking um, – you know, in a kind of diverse way and, and with a very open mind and, and kind of open eyes at, you know, who can hire you and, and who you should be hitting up for work. Um, it shouldn't just hang on working for newspapers and magazines. Like you should be looking at your local market. You should be open to doing event work. You know, weddings are an amazing way to get started and to start getting your business churning. If you're pitching, and I'm speaking purely from like journalism standpoint, mm-hmm. if you're pitching, uh, you should be pitching stories that are exclusive. If they're not exclusive, you need to tell that buyer what region they've been sold in. Uh, if, you're, if you've got a story and it's only been published in Italy, don't pitch it to another Italian magazine. Go for the rest of the EU and go for you know, the U.S. and Canada, right? Um, it, so the buyer needs to be aware of where a story is run and if there is competitive, uh, if there's a competitive analysis there saying like, you know, there are other people working on this, but here's where I'm coming from and this is how far I've gotten. That's important information to pitch. Um, I think we're, we're falling into a, a, a world where you're, you're pitching to a, just a couple big photo blogs and the second that your long-term project goes up on one of those, it loses a lot of that exclusivity and value. Right, so if you have something you'd invested a lot of time in, um, I would say don't sell it to a blog for four hundred bucks. Um, you know, hold out and continue to push it out to to publications. Um, what about know. the idea of we talked earlier about content marketing and trying to sure. find work through even through the social networks? You know, Instagram obviously is, a, is a, the the player in that right now. What do you what do you see on that front? Yeah, so I mean, the idea of content marketing is really exciting for visual journalism, and I think that we're, you know, Blink is kind of pushing into that market now. Um, you know, sites like Contently have done a really good job at repurposing kind of a, a writer or a reporter to do copy for brands and for websites and things of that nature. Um, and we certainly want to allow more and more brands to tap into our network of photojournalists, documentary filmmakers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think content marketing can start on like a very uh, – kind of local level. Uh, if you're you know, working, you live in a uh, you know, town like Austin or San Francisco, you know, there are tons of companies out there who need to fill their Instagram feeds and their Facebook pages with great looking photography, really compelling video. Um, and you should be, you know, adding them to your outbound list for your marketing campaigns. Um, but this is kind of, again, this is old school. You just got to reach out to people. You got to do your, you got to do your legwork, right? Yeah, there's a lot of hustle in this business. I, I I don't mean to say that just because we've built Blink that you can build a business on Blink. Right. right? You don't put yourself up there no. and, and wait. Right. Yeah. This is survival. It's, just, of the it's fittest. another tool. And yeah, it's we have a very um, specific use case. Right. It, thankfully, the use case is large enough that it warrants to existing. Right. Mm-hmm. But I think at the the foundation, you know, we're not or the foundation of your question. Uh, we're not the solution. I think that everyone needs to realize that to be an independent uh, creative and to be a freelancer, you know, it's it's 100% hard work, hustle, self motivation, problem solving, um, and the people who figure that out, who know how to market themselves and brand themselves effectively, are going to win. And the people who wait for that phone to ring um, and get bummed out when that one client stops calling, they're they're not going to win, and that's unfortunate. I'm impressed with the way these some of these Instagram photographers have really taken their their feed and turned it into not only a network but a product for themselves. Yeah. But I wanted to make a comment about the content marketing and also new tools that we're sure, seeing that please. kind of come together. I think um, you know crowdfunding has been around for seven eight years. It, it basically came around became popular right at the time of the economic downturn, and it. A lot of people were trying to were sort of waiting in in the water for a while, trying to figure out exactly what the best way was to use it. And one of the things that came out of that was that it is a very powerful piece of marketing collateral that you can use, especially as a visual artist, as a photographer. You have something there that shows your work, but also that you made money from your work that you can use forever and ever and ever to say, "This is where I was then. This is and this is where I am now," versus. This is this is a piece of marketing that I created, and it, it turns out, of course, in this case, that it is content marketing to really help you establish your brand and grow it and and show your base of supporters what they're supporting. So I, I guess 
maybe just rephrasing that to some degree, the the Kickstarter campaign, as it were, the, the crowdsource campaign is more than just getting the money. Yep. It in of itself is your your brand, yeah. your advertising, your validity. Exactly. Yeah. Giving people a call to action is very important, mm-hmm. right? Giving mm-hmm. people yeah. something to click on and something to do. Like, don't just show them what you're working on, but like, let them support it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, both of you mentioned in in your talks uh, Airbnb. And uh, I don't know it exactly. has come up a lot. Today. I don't know where I'm going with this exactly. <laughs> but but what is it about this idea of people reaching out to other people and, and kind of avoiding the middleman? Is that the, is that the way to say it? Uh, it's the same thing that, with like Uber. Links- it's the same kind of a thing. We don't want to go with traditional you know, venues. We're going for little individuals. We're going out there doing it on their own. Is it all about the, Everybody's freelance. the technology? I mean, is everybody freelance now? Is, that, <laughs> is there something that links <laughs> that links both of your... Your organizations through this idea. Well, it's funny because we also use Uber sometimes to talk about um, to talk about Space Finder because it's also about availability right at your fingertips. That's and it. Yeah. and it's the same thing with social social yeah. media. Everything is right at your fingertips, and I think that kind of accessibility is what makes things like Airbnb and Uber work. Yeah, I think that you have a lot of people out there who are independents who have been largely underserved. Right. They there haven't been a lot of tools out there for them. And they've been, <laughs> you know, forced to play ball, um, play by someone else's rules. And I think sites like Uber, they came in and they took a taxi industry that hadn't changed in so many years and they created an entire new segment, right? Sites like Blink, we came in, we aggregated tons of people who were never going to get an agent, who were never going to join an agency, right? They were never going to get a staff job. And we gave them a home base where they could be found for work. We empowered the buyers. We got rid of a bunch of pain points that those buyers were having. And they come back a day in, day out to search and connect with shooters. So I think, yeah, it is a technology thing, yeah. right? It, it, it's, it's making things easier for people. It just so happens to be online or through mobile apps. They have great user experiences. They're very easy to figure out, and they give you exactly what you want right when you need it. And I think that's important. Um, you know, thankfully, both of our organizations are benefiting a bunch of people who are kind of on their own. Yeah, it, and, sounds, it sounds like that is a, a link that you use the phrase home base, and, and, and both of your organizations provide that. All righty. Before we sign off, um, either one of you want to give us a little more insight on uh, how to get involved with uh, your organizations and a few last thoughts? Yeah, we're always looking to grow our network, uh, you know, particularly in the U.S. And, and abroad. If you're a professional photographer, video producer, or you're an editor or at a company that needs content uh, created anywhere in the world, you can sign up for an account. We're at www.blink.la. Click that and get an account button at the top. Okay. Teresa? Um, so Fractured Atlas is a membership organization, and we anyone if anyone needs to use our services, they would need to sign up for a membership first online. There are three three levels of membership. The first is a free community level, which allows access to Space Finder and Artfully. And then there's the professional level, which allows one user for our website. And that's $10 a month and gives you access to Space Finder, Artfully, insurance, and fiscal sponsorship. And then the organizational level offers up to three users for our website and is $20 a month. And that also allows access to all of the programs. And that was also, you also just answered one of my questions that I didn't get to before is how do you fund yourself? So there we go. So, so that's we got that one. covered. That's part one. And of then it. If, you, if you wanted to have fiscal sponsorship, you would need to submit an extra application so that our board would review the application, determine whether or not you're a good fit for the program, which most people are. Um, <laughs> and then we go from there. <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you very, very much, Matt. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks, John, Mike producer and co-pilot and Jason Tables, our engineer. Check out Blink at blink.la and the fiscal sponsorship at fracturedatlas.org. Give us your opinions on Twitter at BHPhotoVideo with the hashtag BHPhotoPodcast. And please rate and leave a review on iTunes. My name is Alan Weitz. Thank you so much for joining us today.